Welcome again to In Spirit and welcome to this message series. Um, last week, Pastor Ryan started us off uh, with 10 questions Jesus asked. And uh, this is week two of that. And we're going to be looking at the topic or subject, whatever you want to call it, of doubt. The topic or subject of doubt. And I start off this morning by asking three questions. The first is this Do you ever doubt? Do you ever doubt? The second question is, what do you doubt about? What do you doubt? And the third question is, why do you doubt? Why do you doubt? I think those are good questions to ask because I think we all find ourselves doubting at one time or another. Now, if you... If, if you would have answered that first question when I said, do you ever doubt? If you would have said, no, I doubt that you'd be telling me the truth. I think it's safe to say that we all doubt from time to time. Well, what's the, what's the definition of doubt? When we think about doubt, what is it? And this is whether you look at it in the Greek or the English. To doubt is to waver or to be uncertain or to hesitate. Now, if you couldn't answer the question, do you ever doubt, I could say, do you ever waver on something? Yeah, do you ever hesitate on something? Or are you ever uncertain about something? Huh? I think we live in a world where there's lots of uncertainty. You know, in my prayer this morning, and I talked about the, the news, and I didn't realize what happened in Israel last night until uh, I was standing by the, the coffee stand out there this morning and I was made aware of it. And usually I check the news in the morning. This morning I didn't. I went to bed early last night and I didn't check it this morning. I know that yesterday there was the, 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 the thought or you know, kind of the thing that said, hey, they're going to attack. And I, 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 right? The bottom line is you look at that now and you say, how is this, how is this going to end, right? What's it going to look like? Is there ever going to be peace? When the scripture says, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, and we prayed for war to stop. It's easy for my human brain to say, I doubt it. When we look at solutions, we sort of hesitate and say, this didn't work, that didn't work. Because those things didn't work, what is going to work, right? I think we all find ourselves in points of uncertainty and doubt and hesitancy at times. And then I say, why do we doubt? Why do we doubt? I put a list together here, and the first is comparison. We doubt because of comparison. We tend to compare ourselves to others, don't we? And we doubt we can be like them or do like them sometimes. We compare our pastors. We compare leaders. We compare kids. We compare families. I could do a whole message on this, and we did part of a message a while back, but comparison is dangerous. It's dangerous. It doesn't only cause doubt. It pits people against each other. Comparison creates hard feelings. Comparison creates hurt among ourselves. And it causes doubt. Another reason is our limited knowledge or experience. Actually, I'm skipping one here. Lack of clarity or vagueness. We doubt because we're just unclear of something. We don't have all the instructions or all of the details. So we kind of doubt, you know, and sometimes we look at the news and say, really? Did that really happen? One station says it happens this way. Another station says it happens this way. We see that every day in the news, don't we? Accusation? No. We, we doubt the truth, don't we? There's a lack of clarity or clearness, if you will. There's vagueness. There's limited knowledge or experience. Sometimes we doubt because we just don't have the knowledge. We don't have the experience. I got a new phone. Don't do that two days before you go on vacation. 
I doubt I'm ever going to get that thing. It has artificial intelligence. I don't know what that means. I'm learning it, right? But I doubt that I'm ever going to fully know the capacity of what that little gizmo can do. There's limited knowledge, right? There are people far smarter than me that will understand that, right? So it causes some doubt in me. Lisa keeps saying, you'll get it, you'll get it. I doubt it. (laughs) Sometimes it's impossible for it to happen to us. Right? We doubt it. I had an Uber driver last week, and he was convinced he was going to win the $1.3 billion jackpot. He wanted to stop at the store so we could buy tickets. I'm thinking, why would you do that if you want to win it? He didn't win it. But I doubt that I'd ever win that if I played it, and I don't play it. There's another thing that causes us to doubt, and that's perfectionism. And I've heard perfectionism referred to as a sin. Because we don't live in a perfect world. What is perfect? The Bible talks a lot about that. Perfect and imperfect. I'm not perfect. None of us are perfect. And if we try to be perfect, we will fail ourselves. We doubt that we can ever be perfect. It causes us to doubt perfectionism. Past history of personal failures, right? We've tried and tried or we've tried it before and we've failed each time. We doubt that we could ever get it. Past history of others failing us. Sometimes we don't trust people. We doubt we can trust them because they haven't followed through on their commitments. They, in some way or other, have failed us. And it causes us to doubt. And that leads me to the last one, the trust factor. We've been lied to or hurt by others. We just doubt credibility, don't we? Have we all been there? Only two of you? Of course we've all been there, right? We doubt sometimes, and there's a number of things that revolve around doubt. But what happens when we doubt? Well, we tend to give up hope when we doubt. We tend to just give it up. I doubt it, so when it's going to happen, we give up hope, right? Second, we think of worst-case scenarios. You ever run that through your mind? I do that all the time. Something's wrong, and I think, oh, no, that's going to lead to this, and that's going to lead to this, and that's going to lead to less, and it's going to be a train wreck. That's how the devil works, doesn't it? The devil works in doubt. Gets our minds just the stirring. And then the last one is we lose belief, and we often just give up and fail. We just don't believe it's going to happen or it's not true, and we just sort of give up, and we find ourselves failing. And that just leads to disappointment, right? And depression, and on and on and on and on. Doubt is a serious thing. But what about spiritual doubt? We've talked about the war. We've talked about technology. We've talked about a number of things here, right? But what about spiritual doubt? As Christians, why do we doubt God's promises And I'm preaching to myself this morning, along with all of you. Why do we doubt God's promises? When God says, I will be with you. I will carry you. I will give you hope. I am doing things for your good. This adversity you're facing is refining you. It's strengthening your faith. It's getting you ready for a future in heaven. Why do we doubt God when we're in a mess that God can fix it? It's one thing to doubt worldly things, but it's another thing to have spiritual doubt in a God who is faithful. Why do we doubt? It's a good question, isn't it? Because I think if I ask you to raise your hand, if you ever had spiritual doubt, where's God? Where's God in my problem? Is God really going to be faithful to this promise? We doubt. Why do we doubt? I'd like to say because I'm human. Because it's part of my human nature. Because I don't know it all and I want the answers. And I'm dealing with it right now. And God, I can't wait till here. I, I, I need answers now. And we tend to doubt when we don't get to know right away, do we? 
God, I know you have this greater plan above and it's all mapped out, but I'm here down below trying to figure it out. We doubt because we don't know it all. And I dare say that maybe we doubt because even though we say we trust God, do we really trust Him? Do we trust in the Lord with all our heart? In all our ways acknowledge Him? And He'll make our paths straight? How much do we really trust? Maybe that's a whole other subject for another day. But doubt and trust kind of interrelated, aren't they? Do we really trust God? What does that say about our faith? What does that say about our walk of faith? Our growing faith? Can we look back and see what God has done time after time after time? Does that increase our trust? Or, or do we live in the now saying, God, I know that's all there, but I'm not sure I quite trust you with this right now. Sometimes God calls us to, to, to step out. And take chances, faith chances, to do what we can't do. And then we sit back and, I, I doubt it that I can do that. And that's a good place to be, because if you can't do it, that means that you need God to help you do it. If you could do it on your own, you don't need God. And that's how God works. God works so that we need Him. We need God in our doubt. We need to doubt sometimes because doubt refines our faith, doesn't it? Doubt refines our trust. Doubt creates a reliance on God. Let's look at our text, but first let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your word. This morning as we look at our text, Jesus, Peter, walking on water, Help us look at the subject of doubt and then help us deal with it. In Jesus' name, amen. From Matthew 14, probably a familiar story to many of you, but let's look at it. It's called Jesus Walks on Water. It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back in the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. Night fell when he was there all alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble. Key words. They're in trouble. Can't do this on their own. They're far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. Jesus comes toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water... They were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, It's a ghost! But Jesus spoke to them at once. He said, Don't be afraid. He said, Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Peter says, If it's really you, tell me to come and walk on water. That takes faith, doesn't it? Yes, come, Jesus says. Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified. He began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the Son of God, they exclaimed. Well, who did they think he was? Right? It says, after they had crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesareth. When the people recognized Jesus, the news of his arrival had spread quickly throughout the whole area, and soon people were bringing their sick to be healed. They begged him to let the sick touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched him were healed. I challenge you to go back and read that story. There's so much in there. The caption above it in the NLT, as I read, and probably was on the screen, said, Jesus walks on water. I think another good caption that might have been put over that text is, Peter's faith was tested. 
This isn't just about Jesus walking on water. We know who Jesus is. We might expect Jesus to be able to walk on water. Because we've seen the history of all his other miracles. It shouldn't have been a surprise when Jesus was walking on water. But it's a huge surprise when Peter says, hey, if it's really you, let me come out of the boat. Let me walk on water. That's a matter of doubt, faith, and trust. Peter's faith was tested. Peter jumps out of the boat. What's well, it he jumped? He got over the side of the boat, it says, and he starts walking. Just imagine doing that. He saw Jesus. He knew it was Jesus walking on the He said, Lord. Okay, there's a whole message there. This is his Lord whom he followed as a disciple. Lord, if it's really you, let me come to you. Let me walk on the water and come to you. And Jesus says, come on. What are you going to do, Peter? Peter gets over the side of the boat and he starts walking to Jesus. But when Peter started focusing on the wind and the waves and took his eyes off of Jesus, when fear and doubt stepped in or crept in, Peter starts sinking, didn't he? Peter had sinking thinking. Peter's doubt overcame his trust and his faith. Peter started drowning, if you will, or sinking. Peter steps out with good intentions. And all of a sudden, Peter starts sinking when he focuses on the world, takes his eyes off. And he allowed his fear to take over, didn't he? Doubt, this is important, doubt prevents us from doing or experiencing the best, even the impossible. Let that sink in. (laughs) Doubt prevents us from doing or experiencing the impossible, doesn't it? What if Peter would have doubted when he was sitting in the boat? I'm not going to even ask because I know I can't walk on water. Peter asked and Jesus said, come. Do you realize Peter was the only other person that walked on water? Did the others not trust and say, hey, let us do this too? What was their level of faith? I think they had a lot of doubt just like us because they said, now we know it's really you, Jesus. Were they not thinking it was him to begin with? If you look at the construction of the text, if you will, When Peter asked, Lord, let me come to you, they know it's him, but yet after Peter walks in the water and starts sinking, Jesus reaches out his hand, Peter, Jesus grabs the hand, they they lock hands, Peter starts coming up out of the water, and then the disciples say, now we know it's really you. Sometimes it takes us a while to realize it's really God, isn't it? Sometimes it takes us to sink to realize it's God who's carrying us, isn't it? It's God who's walking with us, taking us through it. We're human. We tend to doubt. Peter wasn't putting Jesus to the test when he said, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. Peter was really putting his faith to the test. He was putting his faith to the test. And Peter experienced an unusual, a highly unusual miracle like none other, but it was an example of God's faithfulness and power in Peter's life. If Peter wouldn't have stepped out, he wouldn't have experienced it, would he? Sometimes I wonder, and this is a side note here in my, in my, my, my message, but sometimes I wonder how much of life are we missing because we're not willing to step out of our comfort zone. How much more does God have planned for you and I that we just say, we can't do it? We can't serve as a teacher, children's worship. We can't pray in front of people. And sometimes I think we've been sitting in church for all these years and we can't pray in front of somebody. What are we even doing? 
got to go back to that series on the Holy Spirit. That, that series just keeps coming back to me. I'm going to re-preach that this summer, not here, but somewhere else. Because I think that when you've got to step out of the boat, you've got to embrace the power of the Holy Spirit. We too often say no to God instead of saying, yes, God, let's see what you can do and I can do when we work together, when we step out in faith. I made the comment earlier, we have a big ministry team meeting tomorrow night, and I'm going to challenge us to step out in faith. Peter, the disciple who walked on water, probably the most difficult disciple that Jesus had to work with. Peter denied him, betrayed him, walked away from him. And yet Jesus says, on this rock, Petros, Peter, I will build my church. On a person who doubted and, and, and failed Jesus time after time, Jesus said, I'm going to take that person, that, that weak person who has failed me, and I'm going to build the church of Jesus Christ on him. Just imagine what he can do with us if we step out in faith. I just think he wants so much more from us. You know, we, 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 we took vacation for for a week and I wrestled a lot. God, what do you want with me? I'm being honest with you. What do you want with me with the years I have left? You didn't give me a second chance after an accident. You didn't give me a, a, a third chance after a kidney transplant and gave me health so I could sit back. What do you want? Let's go, Lord. What does God want with you that you think you can't do? But you can if you have faith like a mustard seed. Say that this won't move and it'll move. Our human nature wants to doubt. And the devil wants you to doubt. And God wants you and I to step out in faith. He doesn't call us to be comfortable. He calls us to be holy. The question is, what is his call? Huh? What is his call? And then the question is, how are you and I going to respond? Huh? Peter didn't fail. Peter was human. Peter was putting faith to the test and God was refining him. God refines us through adversity. God refines us through the impossible. God refines us through the difficulties. If life were simple and smooth, what fun would that be? Life in Jamaica happens for a week. Then it comes back to Jamaican to live in. Huh? In this world you will have trouble. John 16, 33, Jesus says. When Peter was sinking, Jesus was right there, wasn't he? Lord, I can you imagine Peter shouting on the lake, Lord, save me, as he's sinking. I doubt that that was a Coast Guard approved vessel that had all kinds of life vests that they could blow into and it would inflate like they told us on the airplane last week, and I'm thinking, why are you talking about a life vest when we're not going over any water? Precautions, right? They were ready. How are we equipped for when we start sinking? Do we give up the hope? Do we let the doubt increase? Do we look at the wind and the waves, so to speak? And man, it was windy the last two nights, huh? Does that cause us to take our eyes off God? Does the situation tend to take you off of what God can do? Are we so focused on the situation that we're not praying for what God can do? 
See, the fact is when Peter started sinking and he said, Lord, save me, Jesus was right there with his hand. He was right there with his hand. It says he grabbed him. In, 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 in the Greek, it's a pretty intense word. Like he, he literally grabbed him. I think Peter's faith was a little bit restored, wasn't he? Because he knew Jesus was right there. Maybe one of the best things you can take away from this this morning is that you need to realize that when you have that doubting, lack of trust in Jesus feeling, that sinking feeling that, that he's not there and he's not going not gonna to come through for you, is maybe just reach out your hand. Just reach out your hand. Trust him. He's been faithful. Just trust him. The Bible, there's so much more we could say. I want to share two texts with you because I think they speak volumes to us today about the topic of doubt. And the first one is from James, chapter 1, verses 2 through 8. And I'll remember, James is the brother of Jesus, right? If anybody knows Jesus, it's his brother. It says this, Consider a pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its walk or its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. See, what that's saying is when you're going through difficult times, God is using it to do something to you and through you. He says, consider that joy. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave on the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not experience to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Doubt. The second is from John 20, and it's Jesus' appearance to Thomas. This, too, is a, uh, probably a familiar text to many. It says, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. And picture that. They're all together. Thomas hadn't seen him, but the others said, We've seen him. They're in agreement. We've seen the Lord. The other disciples tell him they've seen him, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where his nails were and put my hands into his side, I'm not going to believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Through the, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Imagine that. And picture that, they're all together. Some seen, some didn't. Now it's a week later and Jesus comes walking through the doors, literally through the door or the building because the doors are locked, nobody can get in, but Jesus comes in. I'm going to read the last verse in a minute, but it says, peace be with you. Jesus says to them, peace be with you. Why do you think Jesus said to them, peace be with you? Because they were pretty unsettled, they were hesitant. There was doubt, wasn't there? Jesus knew their doubt. And he says, peace be with you. Well, how do you and I have peace in the middle of our doubt? I'm going to suggest three quick things. First of all is read and know your Bible. If you want to get to know God and his promises, read and know your Bible. Understand it. Will we understand all of it? No. Just like I said, perfection is not attainable. All knowledge is not attainable. But grasp as much as you can, and the more you try, the more you'll understand who God is and how he works. Read your Bible. And second, know that God is always with us. Those were Jesus' last words. Matthew 28, he says, And lo, I'm with you to the end of the age, or the purpose, right? End of the earth. I'm with you to the end of times. That's his promise. And though he physically isn't present, he ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to live within us, not just among us, 
but within us. And the third is, believe in the power of prayer. Don't stop praying. You know, earlier in my prayer, we gave thanks for the fact that Devin, Joe and Sherry's grandson, is home from the hospital. That little kid, child, was sick. Really sick. You know, Pastor Ryan put out a prayer request while I was gone. And he had RSV, and my understanding was in Children's Hospital. He had tubes and everything in him. It wasn't a bright picture. But the family said, we believe in the power of prayer, and they enlisted an army of prayer warriors. And they talked about the prayers of the people from this church. There was belief in the power of prayer. Do you know what? The next day, the tubes could come out of that little guy, and a few days later, he went home. I don't know about you, but that's God's presence. That's God's hand reaching when we're sinking. That's God's hand reaching when we're praying, saying, Lord, save us. Read your Bible. Know he's with you and pray. That's how we deal with doubt. I read John 20, those first verses, but this is the challenge I leave with you this morning. Verse 27. After Jesus, or after Thomas is still doubting, the disciples said, we've seen him. Thomas says, I ain't going to believe it till I see his nail hand, hand, holes in his hands right from the nails. I'm not going to believe it till I see the hole in his side. You guys are just kidding me. The text ends this way. Jesus said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Reach out your hand. Put it in my side. And stop doubting and believe. Amen? Let's pray. God, we know you are good. Proof of that is Jesus coming to die for us. And Lord, yet we're human. We have worldly doubts. We have spiritual doubts. This morning, may this be a good reminder that even in our doubt, you tell us to stop doubting, but our human nature leaves us often doubting. Lord, help us with that doubt. Help us to know your promises. Help us to know that you are right there for us, willing to pick us up, to do what we can't do, to step out in faith, to step out of the boat. Lord, help us understand what you are calling us to, to do what we can't do on our own. That's what you call us to. And then to stop doubting it, just get on with it and do it and believe. In Jesus' name, amen.